we wouldn't exist without your support. Visit patreon.com slash attache to get early access to episodes, discounts on merchandise and books, and most importantly, help us bring episodes like this to you. Here we are back with another little Q&A, lockdown attache. Not quite the same, but uh, here we are. How you doing, Greg? Yeah, I'm doing fine. Uh, all the days roll into one. And, uh, but finding many ways to keep entertained with food at home, cooking a lot more than I ever used to. But damn, do I miss restaurants by about now. Oh, I do too, I do too. And I think it was funny because food was the easiest thing to put a video together about because A, there was so much footage of it and also, it's something that we're both passionate about. And I think what we realized was when we were going back and forth putting the street food video together, there were so many meals that even though they may have been three, four, I think maybe even five years ago that we're still talking about and the list kept growing and growing and growing. And, but there's like maybe five or six experiences that, that weren't necessarily street food, but that were the food and the location. And in many cases, the company and just the, the sheer awesomeness of the experience that we felt were worthy of their own episode. Totally, yeah. Yeah, there's something um, different about street food and like kind of the organized meal. You get to see a lot more of the ritual uh, sometimes in someone's culture of, of sitting down to eat. Uh, particularly, I think, when we went to Japan, which I know we'll talk about, but it felt like you're experiencing some sort of theater uh, rather than just... Uh, having some amazing food. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely. I mean, there's 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 so much great stuff in street food and available in street food, but those those meals where we sat down and it was this almost ceremonial, as you say, there's something magical there. And I, I you know, the, the, the first the one that I always think about and I will I will go out of my way no matter how long I'm there for, even if I'm just going transiting through the city uh, is Joy Hing. Mm -hmm. roasted meats in Hong Kong. <music> Embarrassingly, I actually booked a hotel because it was across the street from Joy Hing. It's kind of a way to go with like every future booking. You've got to think how close to this restaurant can I be? Particularly in Hong Kong, like how close to Joy Hing is this? All their addresses should be in relevance to how close to Joy Hing it is. Yeah, exactly. And if I'm transiting through Hong Kong, I want to know how much time I have. And if it's enough time to get in on the Airport Express, go eat some Joy Hing and then go back to the flight <laughs> again. And I'm not kidding. Uh, so <laughs> I know you're not. I know you've done it. I'm totally okay with it. But Joy Hing, it's funny. The address is Hennessy Road in Wan Chai on Hong Kong Island, but it's actually not. It's it's kind of around the corner, and I swear, if you walk past it and you're not concentrating, you will miss it. It's just this narrow, tiny building, and I think, I don't know about you, but it, when we went and filmed in Hong Kong, it was my first time going there. Yeah, um, it was mine too, yeah. But it's the number one siu mai char siu roasted pork place in Hong Kong mm. by every measure. So we went and we went there and it's, it really is, it's like, you know, crowded and noisy and tiny and the kitchen is sort of semi-open. You can see them hacking up the various animals out of the oven. Uh, right, <laughs> like when right they open there. the door on a James Bond film and they're all like training for some stunt. It's actually exactly. just hacking apart. <laughs> hacking apart roast goose and pork and, and all of these <laughs> wonderful things. I didn't know this. I was, I was reading about this restaurant before we started recording. They've been around since the 19th century. Wow, uh, really? The, in, in one form or another. And when the Japanese invaded Hong Kong in 1941, they closed down uh, and they renamed it the Chinese word, or Cantonese word for uh, Renaissance when it reopened. Uh, cool. And I, the word or the, 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 the word or phrase Joy Hing now means I think some c continuing prosperity or something like that. So. I had no idea it had been such a staple for so long, but... Long may it continue. Exactly. Oh my God. That... I, so we had all... We had the three, right? I think the, the holy trinity, the the pork, goose. Uh, the, the goose, and the chicken. Yeah. And they serve it to you on a bowl of rice. Uh, and 
You're thinking about it right now, I can tell. I know, mouth is watering and it seems to speak for itself because it's so busy all the time and it feels so authentic that they don't need to dress up the place to make it anything more than just the place to sit down and have these meats. There's always a line which stretches towards Hennessy Road, which is the takeout line. And I've done that when, when like the kids are napping in the hotel room and I'm like, I'll be right back. I'm just going to go for a walk. And I <laughs> go down and stand in the takeaway line, come just back with all over your face. <laughs> yeah, just exactly completely covered in it. And I'm, you know, it, it, it's fine. And there's, they're so nice. And it's, you know, it's, it's cheap. I think like for, for the, the combo plate, which is what I just mentioned and a, and a soda or something, it's like. I don't know, 40 Hong Kong dollars, 45 Hong Kong dollars, which is nothing. I think it's under five pounds. That's mad. I think it's dangerous. I think if we lived in the vicinity of Joy Hing, we'd be filling the frame right now. There wouldn't be yeah, a part yeah. of the background. It would just be succulent goose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just love that place. It makes me happy. And I'm, I, it's, it's the one meal that I think I would, I would push an old lady out of the way to get to. Um, and, I'm <laughs> and I've seen you do that too. It's yeah, very violent. yeah. I make no apologies. I make no apologies. <laughs> so if you're going to Hong Kong, when things uh, open up again and Hong Kong finds its feet, go please and support them because if it's not there when I return, I will personally blame you. <laughs> This is something that I had never experienced in in any travel I had ever done. We went to Kurokawa with our good friend Joseph Tame on our Kyushu episode and stayed in an onsen, um, a spring bath house. I I don't know if you were prepared for what we were uh, what we were in for in terms of our culinary adventure, but the meals that they provide at those places, breakfast and dinner were like nothing I have ever experienced anywhere in the world. So over the top, but also absolutely welcome. It was yeah. like, you wake up and you think, okay, am I ready for this breakfast? Because having had it the day previous, you just weren't. And it takes you completely no. off guard. And it actually uh, is tiring in the best possible way. <laughs> It, it really was, I think. And we've subsequently been to other onsens in other parts of Japan, and it wasn't unique to Kurokawa, that that whole sort of fanfare. But there wasn't any fanfare. That was the crazy thing. It was just like, this is what we do. When you pay your B&B &B rate, you get these epic meals included. Breakfast, as you say, was, was in the first place, I think it was... Um, like roasted fish and rice and miso soup and and cold salmon and pickled vegetables and it just went on and on and on. Do you remember like the the fish on the skewer, the salted fish on the oh skewer my God, that was like it was then madness? It had the eyes yeah. still. It was just like basically whole, but so yeah. delicious. And I didn't think that you could have a fish on a stick. <laughs> Excuse the phrase. That is that delicious. I don't know how they prepared it actually but it was just so flavorsome. It was kind of barbecued, wasn't it? Yeah, abs yeah, and then sort of coated in, in salt and that was just breakfast. Everything was hyper local within a couple of, uh, of, of miles of the onsen itself. It changed every single day. And you, there were some, we had, there were some, do you remember, there was a little, um, little oil stove. We each got one and we could cook yeah. some of the, the, the beef on it. And it was oh, just, amazing yeah just so great to kind of also just be trusted of that sort of ceremony they come in and they yeah. reel off the menu which takes about 10 minutes and then they just respectfully leave and you're sat here with all this equipment and food and you just think i oh, guess i'll you. start from the left and work my way to the right i don't yeah. even know how to eat some of this stuff it's so alien but every dish is so delicious in its own way it's such an experience there were so many times where i think we said to each other and to Joseph and to Lindsay when she was with us uh, in Shizenji. I have no idea what that was. I just ate, but it was absolutely delicious. <laughs> <laughs> it was a napkin, Alex. It was a napkin. Oh, that's what it was. I mean, I, f I, I was digging through some stuff and I found the menu from the Kurokawa Onsen. <laughs> and it was 
Not only did it have, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine courses, but then it had instructions on how to eat each of the dishes. But there in, in Kurokawa, um, basashi, which is the raw horse meat, that was the specialty. And it was really good. It was really good. It was delicious. Like the marbling and you were supposed to eat it. It says, please eat with ginger, green onion, and soy sauce. And I did. <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> yeah, I loved every bite of it. I also loved, I think it was actually in Suzenzi rather than Kyushu, but when Joseph, our fixer, ordered a vegetarian option and they brought him a giant sea snail. <laughs> I have never had a vegetarian option like this. Yes, yes. That was one of my all-time favorite Joseph <laughs> moments, of which I have many. But it, this this giant sea snail, which the 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 body, the innards or whatever, was it was cooked in the shell and then the, the juice was drained out of the shell and you, it was sort of served next to it as an aperitif. You know, like you were just supposed to sip, sip the, the snail juice. Uh, Enjoy. I think he had mixed feelings about that as a vegetarian. I told her, I'll have a think about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. But I think even as a vegetarian, he had to concede that they'd done quite a good job of making a sea snail delicious. Whereas, yeah. I don't think those allowances be made in many other places, but it's like, okay, yeah, this is good. They've done it, damn it, they've done it. It's quite nice, actually. I loved every minute of it. In fact, I loved it so much that I've booked to go back to the Kurokawa Onsen in October. Like, fingers crossed that it's actually something possible with my dad, girlfriend, and the rest of uh, my immediate family. And I, I just really hope that I can get back there just because I need them to experience this yeah. crazy feast. It was. It was an endurance sport, but I'm, I, I think the fact that you're going back to the same place because you want your your family to experience it uh, just shows how incredible this place was. Yeah, I'm, I really hope we managed to get there. And I hope the guys in the Kurokawa Onsen are okay during this time. Like, Yeah, me too. They've me been too. through enough. Yeah, oh gosh, with earthquakes and all of that. So if you're ever in Japan, that's, the, that's the, an experience I don't think you can ever uh, deny yourself. Staying in Japan, Japan is the home of so much wonderful food. But this one, when we were putting this list together, you were adamant about this one. And I, it's clearly st struck a chord with you. And I can, <laughs> knowing you, uh, what I know about you, I can actually see why. But describe it. Describe the, the lore of this place that we stopped at. Uh, because I think Joseph needed a wee. <laughs> and I'm so glad that Joseph needed a wee. Well, I think when you say you can understand why I might enjoy this, I think it's because you know me as a bit of a diner connoisseur. Exactly. I, I absolutely love American diners and I love the roadside meal. And Joyful, which is the restaurant where we had Omu rice, is um, exactly that. It's the Japanese version of an American diner. I read an article which you sent me about a guy finding them all over Okinawa. I don't know if it's actually an American influence that maybe it came from, I don't know, American troops wanting some slice from home, but it's definitely very Japanese all at the same time. Roadside diners uh, offering quick, delicious Japanese food um, without compromising, you know, in taste or, or anything like that. And it really does channel the, the aesthetics of an American diner but of this amazing dish of like omelette on rice uh, coming through, which is exactly what omu rice is. It kind of says what it is, you know, it's omelette rice all melting together. It was, it was great. And it was in this tiny little outskirt of, of Kumamoto. It, it, the whole place felt deserted because uh, it was, it was midweek, like two o'clock in the afternoon, I think. And everybody was, was at work. But it was in a small, almost almost village, and it really did feel like you were walking into a Denny's or an IHOP uh, in in Iowa. And yeah. the the menu, like you said, is super simple diner fare. Like if you could if you could transpose Japanese food to a, a Denny's or IHOP experience, this is this is what you got. And I th exactly. I'm pretty sure that the waitress even called us like sweetie or or whatever. <laughs> like there was. 
it, it just it was some it was wonderful and and comforting and easy and delicious and yeah and all I mean just the aesthetics of the place as well there was something so appealing about it yeah I mean it's so this is what I always say about the Japanese is that they take anything any other person does and then they harbor it in and make it a hundred times better they're just I mean, some of the best pizza, or some of the best whiskey, it all comes from Japan, uh, which is controversial, but it's just true hard facts. And I think it's inevitable that they're going to take the American diner and then make it so charming and somewhere that it actually hurts your road trip because every time you see one, you need to pull over and visit it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I sometimes, I think I just send you a picture of joyful diners now and again and and i think you do the same to me just knowing that it will bait me i just need to go now <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah i i loved it it was such a great find and again serendipity has given us so many great food experiences in japan let alone in the rest of our adventures and thank thank god for joseph tame's weak bladder <laughs> i've spoken passionately on attaché and mastication and layovers and basically to anybody who will listen to me about in and out burger on the west coast this immediately will raise the hackles of half of the people watching this because it's a very um divisive subject people are very territorial and factional about in and out versus shake shack and all of the other ones five guys and stuff like that and they're all those guys are fine I love it and out probably because it's the best. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is like leveling all the arguments. It's like, I like yeah, it so because it's the best. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it. Why, why would you like something that's not the best? But in and out's great. I, I, I crave it fortnightly. Uh, and whenever I'm in California, I eat obscene amounts of it. But the specific experience that uh, we wanted, to, we both actually put this on our list, was the one at... LAX, Los Angeles Airport, because it is like a burger experience that you cannot find anywhere else in the world. Because not only are you sitting out on this patch of grass in front of the In-N-Out Burger, eating your double-double animal style, making a mess, <laughs> but screaming over your head every 35 seconds at about 250 feet are A380s and 737s and Dreamliners because it is right at the very end of one of the busiest runways in the world. So you have, you're have you getting sprinkled with jet fuel and chemtrails and all that fun stuff. <laughs> Makes it taste so much better. It really does. It really mm. does. It's such a, it's such a, a great place. And not a, it would be different if it was like a McDonald's or whatever. You know, you go there, and I like McDonald's. You go there, eat the food, and the planes are going over. That's cool. But it's in and out and airplanes. Yeah, it's pure adrenaline running through your body, not just sugar and salt and processed cheese. It's adrenaline of engine fuel and loud noises and big hunks of metal just flying through the sky miraculously overhead. I love it. And what a welcome to LA. If you're flying over and you see everybody on the grass patch like eating their in and out burgers, it's like, oh yeah, this is why I came. And the, the great thing is just because it's like Joy Hang in Hong Kong, in America, no matter where you're going or if you're connecting to a flight, when you land, you have to go through immigration, get your bags. So you're already landside. And then you just jump in a taxi or an Uber and it's like three minutes away from, from arrivals. Go have an in and out which is great in and of itself, and watch the planes fly over your face. Yeah. I, I, it's such a great experience. Yeah, I can't think of many landside airport dashes you can do that's better than that one i mean obviously joy no. hing but it's going to take you a minute like three minutes you've got no excuses go get your animal style fries no excuses exactly <laughs> back to japan and there's a reason there's i think japan is it, it's i we are unapologetically japan heavy in this video because we've been there more than any other country, first yeah. of all, uh, for, for episodes, and there's so many unique and wonderful food experiences. But at the end of our first trip, which was the Tokyo episode, so many of the people that we became 
wonderful friends with that participated in some form or another in the production of the episode or were just friends of friends we all congregated in uh in golden guy in in piss alley the beautifully named piss alley <laughs> yakitori alley and we went to a yakitori joint and just had some post uh post-production beers but actually it yielded some of the most wonderful attache memories that that i have to this day me too uh, yeah. it was such a send-off five or six of us maybe even seven of us in, in in total on a on a long communal table in one of the bigger yakitori joints in, in that alleyway um which is a really tight like you you have to sort of shuffle to get past a person but then you you pull back the doors and this place was, was pretty big and are there any dishes that you remember particularly about that evening the standout ones um of course you had the yakitori the chicken skewers but then i can't erase the memory of raw chicken that we had uh yeah but it was such a novelty and it actually was delicious and something I will always be able to brag to people afterwards. This dish of raw chicken was slid in front of us and I honestly thought, are they are they effing with us? Yeah, and are I, they, I and also thought like, we have a flight tomorrow. Like, I don't want to have some ugly food poisoning on whatever sort of, is it 13 hour flight or something like that? It sounds like a nightmare to me. Like, should, is it clever to take even a small bite of this raw chicken right now? But they proved us wrong and, and it, it is it is raw chicken it's not like you know slightly under you know undercooked it's freaking raw uh and he explained that there's that the chicken was alive half an hour before so the opportunity for bacteria and other nasties to develop is um is very different and that japanese food hygiene and um, animal rearing standards are totally different from what we have in the west um there's lemon juice and soy and ginger and a few other things that while also enhancing the flavor are antibacterial and it's very 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 common we'd had it many times before on subsequent visits to japan and it's actually delicious right like i think that's what surprised me the most is that it you realize that most meat in its raw form probably tastes a lot like the meat that you're eating in its cooked form like no, it's not so much. Obviously, things change in the cooking process, but raw chicken tastes like chicken. I think it's just yeah. accentuated in the methods that you use afterwards. So I don't think I expected that at all. And yeah, you'd expect it to be unpleasantly chewy because we've all sort of hacked apart a, you know, a Tesco chicken thigh and uh, before we've cooked it. And it, it, it wasn't that. You know, not a slight on, on anything, but I don't think you can pick up a chicken from Tesco and eat it raw without there being some extreme repercussions. No, I mean, try and just let us know how it goes. Just it'll be a fun experiment. <laughs> Instagram it. But I'm not. IGTV. Yeah. <laughs> So this, uh, moving on to another experience that was perhaps a little out of, well, my comfort zone, cer certainly, but ended up being revelatory, was when we were in Delhi and we were with a good friend, Kalyan Karmakar, uh, who was with us in a M the Mumbai episode as well. And he took us to all these incredible places, but the, the, the place that stands out to me the most by a country mile was Kaki de Hotel in Connaught Circle in the, in the middle of Delhi, mm -hmm. and it was again the same as Joy Hing. You would have if, if we had not been with him, I am certain that we would have walked right past it. Yeah, um, it's really unassuming again, and actually, really unass I think yeah. it was really rare. But at that point, there wasn't even a queue when. When we went back later at night, the queue was big and you can tell it's a really popular thing amongst Delhi locals. But I think we, because maybe with Kalyan, he knew all the ins and outs. He got us there at a time where we didn't have the queue. So it was so unassuming. You would never think this place was such a popular spot. Yeah, it, it, you're right. Cause I think we, we went and found a beer, which is surprisingly hard to do outside of hotels in Delhi. And we walked past, I think maybe like even at 10, 11 o'clock at night. And there was a huge crowd around it. And I remember Kalyan saying that it's so famous and so popular that there are counterfeit 
versions of the restaurant all over Delhi and all over India. So um, wild as well. I mean, you know, yeah, you know that you've made it when when that happens. And he he ordered. What's cool is when you walk in on the left hand side by the windows are all these literal vats of of for want of a better or more elegant word curries bubbling away and he said Callion explained that because they're always cooking and because it's always hot the chances of you getting sick are nil because there's they're at a temperature where everything is going to be um to be completely safe and they brought us um maybe five or six different dishes yeah um, which basically meat or and or vegetables in in sauces, stacks of roti, no rice. And for me, the one that really uh, shook me was the goat brain curry. I haven't even had that much goat in my life, let alone goat brain. Uh, but it was delicious. It really was, and it looks like looked and almost had the texture of uh, al dente cauliflower. That's pretty I mean, spot on. Yeah. <laughs> It, it could have been if you said, "Oh, it's just cauliflower." I would have not challenged it, but it was it was there, and it's again, it's one of those things that, that we don't need a lot of brain in in British or American cooking, uh, and it, it took a little bit of a, a moment to sort of I was going to say wrap your head around it, but you know what I mean, like just to to get over the fact that yeah. it is brain. Once you did that and it, you tasted it, and I think I even said on camera that there. I had, there were flavors in those meals that I had never experienced anything like in my life. There are flavors there that I have literally never experienced. And there were six or seven dishes that I would have dismissed in the olden days because I was naive and stupid mm. because it had something in there that I wasn't familiar with, a piece of an animal or something that just, that here we would have, like liver, where we yeah, would have just, yeah, yeah. or kidneys, uh, where you literally boil the piss out of them. There, it was just, uh, it just, uh, I loved that place. I don't know. I keep thinking about it. They were so friendly and kind and interested in what we were doing. They kept bringing us like more dishes to try that we hadn't ordered because they were just proud of them as well. I know another family owned business. Yeah, it's one of the things it's we, just lovely. we keep repeating about Attaché is that it's a good thing that we walk an average of like, what is it like 17 kilometers a day because the generosity of the people we visit they're always giving us so much food that if we didn't walk those distances, uh, yeah, we wouldn't get back on the plane, I don't think. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah, we have to, to walk it off. And especially when it's 600 degrees and a billion percent humidity like it was in Delhi, I think we uh, we earned that goat brain curry. <laughs> we did. <laughs> so with, with that five or six plus the street food ones and all of the like 150 foods that we experienced on our episodes but didn't talk about, when we are able to get out there and travel the world again, what what dish or experience or food are you just craving and would jump on a plane tomorrow to get? It's a tough one and there's so many that I just want to go around and just like gorge on every food that I've missed. But I think what I've really been craving is the black truffle dumplings from Din Tai Fung. But it has to come from the Hong Kong branch. Uh, I've been to the London one and no discredit, it's great, but there's something special about the ones they do in Hong Kong. Um, so I need to go there as soon as lockdown will permit me. <laughs> yeah, oh, I know what you mean. I think I, maybe it's because we were just talking about Delhi, but the one that I am most looking forward to or just want is the Choli Batori that we had with Kalyan that one day for breakfast with the with the flat, uh, not not the puffy chole, the the bready one where you tear and the the pickled carrots and the the chana. Obviously, oh, that's just that was the most one of the most satisfying breakfasts I think I've ever had. So good. Yeah, I remember that really special stuff. Yeah, I mean it's definitely one of the ones I haven't tried to re-engineer yet, but I've tried jambing and even the Amani uh, breakfast rolls recently, and it doesn't quite cut it. So there's still a reason to get out there after all this finishes. I, uh, yeah, I just can't, I can't, I can't recreate generations of culinary prowess <laughs> and I can't figure out why. Uh, but this <laughs> it's, a nice, it's a nice way to end, just looking backwards and then looking forwards to, to when we can travel. So I just want to go around the world and start eating again. Yes, 100%, <laughs> the attache credo. <laughs> yeah, travel and eat. Ha ha ha.